Thank you all. Remain standing. Worship with us. And there is a name I call in my troubles, and there is a word I speak to my fear, and there is a power to silence my worries, and let it ring out for the whole world to hear, and Jesus, your name is a light in the darkness, hope for the hopeless, strength for the weak. And so oh, what a Savior, that there's no one greater. Jesus, your name I forever will sing. And no other name can carry my burden. With just a word, my Jericho falls, and no other voice leads me to victory. It's over my battle, it's over it all. Jesus, your name is a light in the darkness, hope for the hopeless. Strength for the weak. Oh, what a Savior. There's no one greater. Jesus, your name I forever will sing. And Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I fruit him over and o'er. And Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, there is no other name I adore. No other name can call down the heavens. No other word has the power to save. And no other voice can speak resurrection and roll back the stone and empty the grave. Jesus, your name is a light in the darkness, hope for the hopeless, strength for the weak. And so oh, what a Savior, there's no one greater. Jesus, your name I forever will sing. And Jesus, your name I forever will sing. And Jesus, your name I forever will sing. We are called to worship. Uh, I want to welcome any guests who are here this morning. Welcome to Broadway Baptist Church. Uh, uh, we are so glad you are here, and we want to connect with you. Uh, and the best way for us to do that, if we don't get a chance to, to see your face, uh, is this card. It's in the pew back. Uh, there's a lot of stuff on there, um, uh, things that if you're interested in certain ministries, if you need prayer or, or want to connect in some way, uh, this is the best way to do that. And so when the offering plate comes around, you can drop that in the offering plate. Uh, or if it's taking you a little more time, uh, you can do it after the service and drop it in one of the black boxes in the foyer. Uh, but we are so glad uh, that you are here to worship with us this morning. Hopefully you received the bulletin when you came in. Uh, be sure and check out all the things going on uh, today. Uh, we are having the Lord's Supper, and that also means we have business meeting tonight at 6 o'clock. So for members, and uh, if you're attending business meeting, there are packets in the foyer as well uh, for business meeting information. Uh, let us be called to worship through the reading of the scripture. I'm going to be reading from Psalm 47. Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord 
the Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations, God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Amen.
Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the invited to be seated at this moment we're going to go into our time of what we call the lord's supper <clears throat> we observe the lord's supper here at broadway baptist church six times a year so the next time that we observe the lord's supper will actually be at our christmas eve candlelight service and that's actually a family style lord's supper that we do at five o'clock on uh, december 24th so we're going to have our lord's supper and this is in the baptist church this is one of two ordinances um what that means is we have, um, as, as, as Christians, the Bible teaches us that we are to observe the Lord's Supper and then we're also to observe baptism. So that's what we do uh, throughout our church, just observing these different, different ministries. So after we have the Lord's Supper here, we're going to have our offering. So at this time, I'm going to invite um, our, our deacons to stand up. Light of the world, you stepped out into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see the beauty that makes this heart of gold. Hope of a life spent with you. And here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to King of all days, oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. As humbly you came to the earth you created, all full of sin became poor. And here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. I'll never know how much it costs to see my sins upon that cross. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sins upon that cross. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to
seated you actually are holding two cups so you want to lift up your first cup from your second cup and then we'll, we're going to start with our, our bread um, during the time of the Lord's Supper this occurred with Jesus and his disciples and what we call the upper room this would have been the Thursday night meal right when he, he has this final meal with his disciples and then he goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane and he's arrested there but during this meal he's they don't, they don't understand what's going on. And he's explaining to them that this is the Passover, what we call the Seder meal, uh, and um, how they would have understood this. And he picks up a piece of bread, and he explains to them that this represents his body. He's going to be the sacrifice. And Jesus told us in the book of John that he is the bread of life. So when we eat this bread, we're participating. This is, by the way, this is for believers. So if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, this is for you. We're identifying with Christ, saying He is, uh, I'm, I'm participating in who He is, the body of Christ. Jesus went to the cross and He gave His body, His life on the cross for our sins. He picks up the piece of bread and He prays over it. So let's pray over our bread. God, we thank You for this bread. We thank You that You are just blessing our lives so much. And Lord, I just pray that we never forget the cost that was paid on the cross for us. And Lord, we just pray that you um, forgive us of our sins. Lord, we remember what the cross was all about. Lord, remember that you stepped into the world this Christmas season and you came into the world so we can be forgiven. And Lord, we just give thanks for everything you've given us and we thank you for identifying with this bread as the bread of life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. After the bread, then Jesus picks up the cup. The cup represents Jesus' blood. So what happened is, in the Old Testament, you have to understand how forgiveness of sins occurred. You would have blood that would spill over the altar with the priest in the Old Testament at the temple, and that would represent the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus is saying, we're doing away with that. This new sacrifice is me. And his blood would spill on the altar. That altar is the cross so we can be forgiven. So he picks up this cup and he shares them that we receive forgiveness of sins because of his blood. And the reason we're doing this, we're doing this as a reminder to observe it is so that we never take for granted and forget of the cost that Christ paid. So he picks up the cup with his disciples and he prays over his cup. Let's pray over our cup. God, we thank you for this blood. This represents what you shed on the cross so we can be saved. Lord, we are forgiven by your blood. And Lord, we pray we never get over, we never forget, we never uh, get past the importance of forgiveness of sins. This is how we go to heaven. You remove our sin from us so we stand innocent before you. Lord, we just pray you bless this cup and pray that it just helps us remember who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So after the Lord's Supper, uh, it says they sang a, a hymn. So our hymn is going to be our offertory hymn. So I want to encourage you. I believe our deacons are going to help pass our offering plates. So we're going to start singing another song. Then we'll pass our offering plate. Your giving goes to support the ministry and mission of Broadway Baptist Church. So why don't we, oh wait, we don't stand on the offering. So why don't our men stand up and then we'll pass our offering plates. Joey, do you mind passing the offering plate? There is nothing worth more that'll ever come close. Nothing can compare your living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've 
tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome come flood this place and fill the your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There is nothing If you'd like to stand this morning and worship with us, please go ahead. The Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. Oh, your presence, Lord. experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long. To be overcome by your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Father God, we thank you that we can come here and worship you together with.
uh, this congregation, our brothers and sisters around us. Give us opportunities to share this love that we sing about to the world around us, to our community around us. We thank you so much for Pastor Daniel, for the hard work he puts in every week, uh, for his constant, uh, constant challenge, the constant uh, battle it is against the devil to, to bring a message every morning that uh, is from you. So we thank you uh, that you give him that strength and that resolve. We just pray for a wonderful day today. Let us continue to worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. So in one second, we're going to have our, um, our uh, Miss Sarah, are you teaching? Uh, so Miss Sarah Rios is teaching our children's church today. Uh, Zach made a couple announcements. I wanted to remind everybody, uh, uh, um, if you're new to our church, we started our Broadway membership class. So it kicked off uh, today, it, it meets during Sunday school, and you can actually join our church if you want to get reconnected, if th this is truly the entrance place to our church. So you can join us next year, there's three more sessions left, and it starts up this coming, uh, I mean it's every Sunday in Sunday school, right there when you walk in the fellowship hall, it's right there on the left when you walk in, and we meet from 10 to 11, so we had four people in there today, so they're going through the process of uh, learning more our church and getting connected, so it's certainly encouraging about that. Also, I wanted to uh, share, Zach mentioned about a uh, business meeting tonight. I want to invite everyone to church tonight. Tonight is business meeting. Uh, on this past Wednesday night, we'll be presenting our budget, uh, business meeting tonight. This past Wednesday night, uh, I had the opportunity to share during budget discussion about a vision for growing our church and moving forward. So I hope you can all come tonight and hear that again if you weren't there on Wednesday and then participate as if a member of our church. You can participate and vote in business meetings. So that's tonight. We'll be preaching on the parable of the talents. It's at 6 o'clock. It's only going to be a 7 or 8 minute sermon because so we can get into business meeting. But I know you'll be blessed by coming to that. So those are uh, some of the things going on um, uh, today and, and certainly next week with that. All right, Miss Sarah. We have children's church, so if you're a little one and you want to go to children's church, you want to stand up, you're going to follow Miss Sarah Rios downstairs to children's church. Any other children? Oh, oh, a question? A business meeting? Business meeting is right here. I wouldn't have enough room downstairs. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll meet here, um, and, you know, everybody, if you're 12 years old and you're a member of our church, you can come and vote in business meetings, so uh, if you've been saved and baptized and joined our church, you're welcome to come vote, so everybody needs to be here tonight, so it's a great uh, opportunity to participate and being part of your church and laying out a vision and excitement for the future for a broad way, so, okay, so... Uh, Thank you, Carrie. I don't get a lot of questions from the audience, but every now and then, you know, you. <laughs> so that's our Wednesday night crowd. So, okay, open up your Bibles to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. We're in Daniel chapter 4. I want to tell you, I, I love the book of Daniel, and I hope these are long chapters. So, I hope in your devotional time this week, I hope you're reading through this uh, book. So, as we go through this book here of the Bible. And I'm going to give you some background information on where we're at. Basically, the first four chapters of the book of Daniel are about a, the king in whose name Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was of, in world history that he led the first what we would call empire. Now, there's been great countries throughout before this, such as Egypt during the time of Moses. It was very powerful. But and also during the time of David and Solomon, you had Israel. But those countries were contained in their land. They weren't expanding out and taking other territory. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. But Babylon didn't just stay in Iraq. It just expanded into all areas of the known world at that time. And it was actually the first world empire. So you have to remember, how did Daniel, who's a Jewish man, how did he even end up? Because what happened, Nebuchadnezzar came and captured all that area of Israel and 1,500 miles away, and took all those people with him. So he had all control of all of that land. So this is a, truly a world leader. The very first one 
in the history of humanity. And what's about to happen here is God is going to humble Nebuchadnezzar. And what's important about Babylon, Babylon is one where you read about in the book of Daniel, but it's actually going to come back again. It's coming back in Revelation. And Revelation, during the period of the Antichrist, he is going to name his kingdom Babylon, the Bible tells us. And it will be named after that because he will lead an empire of the world. And the very first empire of the world was led by Nebuchadnezzar, named Babylon. So this is going to be making a full circle, and it will be returning. And, and the, and, but Babylon in the book of Revelation ceases to exist. The Lord Jesus destroys it in Revelation chapter 18. It's no more. It falls. And we're about to see here the fall of Nebuchadnezzar, but we're also going to see the restoration of this man. When I, I grew up in the late 80s and 90s, and when I was growing up, there was a video game called Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. It was like on Atari or the old-timey Nintendo. I grew up playing that, and I grew up watching. We didn't do the pay-per-view on TV back then and watch his fights, but I would get the replays, and you would hear about Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson was a dominant fighter. I mean, he was just, I mean, he'd, he'd knock everybody out in the first few seconds of a fight. He was just that powerful of a man. He was a legend 40 years ago. And I remember that of Mike Tyson, how powerful he was. And just, he was just, it was, it, you were just wondering how short is the fight going to be until he knocks the guy out. And um, so I actually go to bed pretty early, or at least I try to. It's hard for me to stay up past 1030 at night. But Friday night, Mike Tyson hasn't fought a fight since 2005. So, I mean, we're, we're talking 19. He's in a 20-year retirement here. And, but he had this fight on Netflix that said it was going to start at 8 o'clock at night. Now, I, I logged on Netflix. That fight didn't start till after midnight. And you had to go through a four-hour commercial and all these other fights and everything else, and just a giant circus is what you're watching till you get to the main event. And all you're hearing about the whole time, Mike Tyson's coming up, Mike Tyson. So the, the buildup is through the roof. Now, what you forget about Mike Tyson, what I remember about this man 35 years ago was he was 25 years old, 23 years old, and he was a champion, young man, prize fighter. The Mike Tyson that stepped in the ring at midnight on Friday, was a 58-year-old man. <laughs> and he lost. Like the guy, so what happened? The guy that I envisioned as a young man was not the man who showed up in the ring. You know, he was a lot slower. He was a lot older. I mean, he had white hair. I mean, he was just a, you can see a white goatee. So this isn't the prize fighter. He ended up losing. But I mean, he hung in there. He, get, he didn't get knocked down. But you're kind of, you're anticipating this and you get this down here as a fight. It wasn't quite what you expected. Well, Mike Tyson, in many ways, he got humbled. Not so much humbled because he wasn't a good fighter. He got humbled because he's nearly 60 years old and he's in the boxing ring. Age humbled him more than everything. He was just a lot slower. Well, Nebuchadnezzar here in this story, he is about to be humbled by the Lord because he did not acknowledge God. That's what this whole thing is about. Do you know, we, uh, we, look at, we, have, we turn on the news and we hear about world leaders all the time. But you know, the world leader we want to follow is the one that comes to the TV cameras and says, I acknowledge that the Lord God is over everything and He controls this world. You just don't hear world leaders talk like that. And that's what Daniel is going to tell Nebuchadnezzar to say and to repent of his sins and to turn to the Lord and to acknowledge the Lord and to recognize that the Lord is sovereign, not Nebuchadnezzar, and he didn't do it, and God is going to humble him. So that's where we're going to be. So I want you to turn in your Bible to Daniel chapter 4, verse 19. While you turn there, I hope you have a bulletin. Lately I've been putting uh, these pictures in your bulletin. I want, you to, I want to reference this because... We're about to interpret a dream. This dream here is this picture in your bulletin. It's a picture of a tree. And 
This tree here is what Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of. This tree is in the center of the earth. And it supplies the earth with everything. It has fruit. It has shade. It has, it, ho- it has a home for all the birds. All the people come and eat from it. You go to this tree and you receive whatever you need. And this tree here is a picture of Nebuchadnezzar's life and his kingdom. And it's going to be cut down. What's going to happen is God is going to send an angel to cut down the tree. And then the tree will die. All that's going to be remaining is a stump. All the fruit will be gone. All the birds of the air will fly away. And this tree is going to be humbled. And what's going to happen, it says in the Bible, this is one of the most interesting things in the Bible, the stump is then going to transform and somehow it starts to take on the, a, a person, a man. And the man starts eating grass like a cow. The man, all of a sudden, he starts to grow like feathers and it has, his hair becomes like an eagle. And he starts growing claws. And he, he doesn't hang out with other humans. He spends his time with the animals in the barn. And you think, what is going on here? What it is, is that is how God is going to humble Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible says, is going to lose his mind, his sanity. And he's going to start eating grass and acting like one of the animals. And have long claws, long fingernails, and he's going to have hair like that of an eagle. And it's going to, God's going to humble him until he repents and acknowledges the Lord God. That's what we're going to see here in this Bible story. So as we read through this, these chapters in Daniel are kind of lengthy, so that's why you need to do your pre-reading at home. Uh, so that's, I just went through the first 18 verses, giving you some background information. He has this dream, he's very upset, he doesn't know what to do. But God has given Daniel the gift of dream interpretation, and he's going to interpret this dream. And Daniel's very alarmed when he finds out about the dream. So I want you to open up your Bibles. Follow along. Open up your Bible app and follow along here. Daniel chapter 4, verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name is Belshazzar, that's Daniel's Babylonian name, was stunned for a moment. And his thoughts alarmed him. The king said, Belshazzar, don't let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Meaning Daniel hears about this dream and he becomes upset. He's like, "Uh uh-oh, this is not good. This dream is bad news, Nebuchadnezzar. But, But Nebuchadnezzar wants to know, what is the dream? I need to know. Tell me what's going on. Belshazzar, i.e. Daniel, answered, My Lord, may this may the dream apply to those who hate you and its interpretation to your enemies. Because he knew this is a bad interpretation. It's not good news what's going to come. So Daniel's saying, hopefully the Lord will show mercy and maybe this will be cast off on someone else. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong, whose top reached the sky and was visible to the whole earth, and whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all, under it the wild animals live, and in its branches the birds of the sky live. That tree is you. This is the picture. This is actually a very accurate picture. This is a picture in your bulletin of the tree. And you look at it, and that is a picture of Nebuchadnezzar. That, and he's saying, that is you, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar. And it goes on to say here, Your majesty, for you have become great and strong, Your greatness has grown and even reaches the sky, and your dominion extends to the ends of the earth. The king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it. So all of a sudden, this great tree, an angel is going to come and cut down the tree. But leave the stump with its roots in the ground and with a band from the bronze around it and the tender grass of the field Let them be drenched with dew from the sky and share food with the wild animals for seven periods of time. This is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree that the Most High has issued against my Lord, the King. Look at this. You will be driven away from people 
to live with the wild animals. You will feed on grass like cattle and be drenched with dew from the sky for seven periods of time. That's seven years. Nebuchadnezzar is going to be a wild animal for seven years. Until you acknowledge that the Most High is ruler over human kingdoms and He gives them to anyone He wants. As for the command to leave the tree stump with its roots, your kingdom will be restored to you as soon as you acknowledge that heaven rules. That's a key verse there. Daniel said, if you acknowledge the Lord, if you repent and turn to the Lord, your kingdom will be restored. Therefore, may my advice seem good to you, my king. Separate yourself from your sins by doing what is right and from your injustices by showing mercy to the needy. Perhaps there will be an extension of your prosperity. So you see how Daniel is encouraging Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, perhaps if you turn to the Lord and you repent of your sins, the Lord will show mercy and you will remain prosperous and this, this horrible dream of you losing your sanity and becoming an animal like, an, a, a, like a cow, perhaps it won't happen. So now look what happens here. Verse 28, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of the 12 months. So do you all understand? He had 12 months. Daniel gives him this warning. You, if you don't repent, if you don't acknowledge the Lord, you are going to become a cow, basically. You're going to act like a wild animal. And he had 12 months to do that. But look what happens here. At the end of the 12 months, as he was walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon, the king explained, exclaimed, this is how uh, arrogant he was, God humbles proud, arrogant people. Is it not Babylon the great that I have built to be a royal residence by my vast power and for my majestic glory? So he's walking around his royal residence. It's kind of like King David. He did the same thing when he saw Bathsheba. He's just He's idle, he's bored. He's just walking around thinking about how great he is, how he can have anything on earth. And he's bragging to himself how wonderful he is. And look what happens. While the words were still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared that the kingdom has departed from you. You will be driven away from people to live with the wild animals. And you will feed on grass like cattle for seven periods of time until you acknowledge that the Most High is ruler over human kingdoms and that He gives them to anyone He wants. So all of a sudden, this angel, uh, or the Lord speaks to him and says, you are about to be humble. You are going to become an animal. At that moment, the message against Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people. He ate grass like cattle and his body was drenched with dew from the sky until his hair grew like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. So you can see this man was totally transformed. He became, he had a desire for eating grass. He had dew all over him. He didn't bathe. His hair, he became like an eagle's nest. It's just hair, feathers, and he had these claws of a hand. He didn't take care of himself. There was no hygiene whatsoever. And what's going on here is in this story is God is humbling this man. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with pride. He thought he was great and majestic. He was the very first world empire leader, and he thought, he had already made him chapter before a golden statue. He just thought he was the greatest there was. And God is coming along saying no. And I think the principle of what we get from this is if we are left to our own desire, our own sinful nature, we go the route of animals. We see this in Romans chapter 1. Now, there is a difference between us and the animal world. Do you know in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, the Bible teaches us that we were created, humans, only humans, were created in the image of God. I have a pet dog and I have a pet cat. We love our cat and we love our dog, 
but they were not created in the image of God. You say, Pastor, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? Well, the image of humanity is the image of Christ, Jesus. When he came to earth, he took the image, he became a man. He took this image, this is what he looks like. He looks like a man like us. But also what it means, the image of God, is what separates us from the animal kingdom is the image of God, God's attributes, one of them is He's eternal. So God has no beginning and He has no end. When we are created, when God creates us in the womb and we become a living being, we become eternal. You say, what does that mean? I live forever? Your soul does live forever. As much as we love our furry friends at home, they do not have souls. Our animals do not live forever. John, this is the difference between the animal kingdom and humanity. That one thing, the image of God, is what separates it. So, when we see Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible is going to say, tell us here, he's lost his mind, and he has gone back to these animal, uh, sinful ways that he just leaves, lives as a beast of the field. And for us, when we don't acknowledge the Lord, when we don't have Christ as our Lord and Savior in life, we too will go in that direction. That's what happens with unconfessed, un, uh, uh, unconfessed sin just leads down to moral depravity. And that is what's happening here to Nebuchadnezzar. An unredeemed man just gets worse and worse and worse. He just goes farther and farther away from the Lord. And that's what's happening here with Nebuchadnezzar. He's, he's now acting like he's part of the animal kingdom. He's eating grass, hanging out in the barn. He's, not with, he, he's isolated himself from other humans. That's why we, we all love animals, but we are not animals. We shouldn't be acting like we're animals. We don't we aren't furries. If you ever see one of those, we don't eat dog and cat food. We are different than the animal kingdom. And how that difference is because we as humans were created in the image of God. Do you all understand? So what's happening here, and it says here, so keep going here. This is why this man did this. Verse 34, but at the end of those days, so the end of those days are seven years. He had to act like an animal for seven years. At the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven and my sanity returned to me. He realizes, what am I doing? This is what repentance looks like. When you realize, here I am living in a pig pen. Remember the story of the prodigal son? He also ended up in a pig pen. He was eating what the pigs were eating because he was in rebellion against God. And he found himself in a pig pen, and he also, he, the Bible says, he came to his senses. At some point, you have to realize, this is not the way for me. This is not the way to live. This is not how God wants me to be. And folks, we don't have to go through the pig pen. We don't have to go through the animal kingdom if you just repent and you live your life for the Lord. This prideful man had the opportunity. Daniel came to him and said, you know, you can repent. You can confess your sin, Nebuchadnezzar. The pride is destroying you. It doesn't have to be that way. But he didn't listen. He had 12 months and he found himself, uh, found himself just like a cow living in the pig pen. But his sanity did return. I actually believe Nebuchadnezzar got saved in these next few verses. This is, the very, this is really interesting. This man is going to turn to the Lord. When we go to heaven, we're going to see the very first world empire leader there. You're going to be surprised, and it's going to be Nebuchadnezzar. And he, you can ask him what it's like eating grass and, uh, and having eagle's claws, but that's, that's what he went through. But he, God restores this man. It says here, I, Nebuchadnezzar, verse 34, look to heaven, and my sanity returned to me. Then I praised the Most High and honored and glorified Him who lives forever. Look what this man says. This is the last few verses we see of Nebuchadnezzar's life. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is, in, is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, and he does what he wants with the army of heaven. And the inhabitants of the earth, there is no one who can block his hand or say to him, what have you done? 
At that time, my sanity returned to me, and my majesty and splendor returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and my nobles sought me out. I was reestablished over my kingdom, and even more greatness came to me. So what happened when this man repented, when he turned to the Lord, when he realized, I don't need to act like an animal anymore, this, act like an unredeemed, unrepentant man, when he turned and repented of his sin, God actually reestablished him. And that's why in this story, in this picture of the tree, he was still, there was still a stump left. Meaning there's still a stump. You're going to come back, Nebuchadnezzar, but you're going to have to go through a period of pain for seven years of acting as an unredeemed man. And then look here at the last verse. Last verse of this afternoon. It says in verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and glorify the King of the heavens, because all His works are true, and His ways are just. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. This man confessed the Lord. He became a believer. He recognized his pride and arrogance. And him thinking he built this wonderful empire. It's God who establishes kings. It's God who removes kings. The Bible says in the book of Job, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. God gives us life. God takes away life. God gives us jobs. He takes away jobs. God gives you a family. Gives you a spouse. He takes away that spouse. He gives you your children. Your children takes them away. It's this picture of everything we have comes from the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, this whole book right here, this whole chapter right here, was about Daniel trying to plead with him and says, Nebuchadnezzar, you need to acknowledge, you need to recognize it is God who is in control of this situation, not you. And I think in our own personal and our spiritual lives, the Lord is speaking to us and He's telling us the exact same thing. As we go about our life and the things and challenges, we have to acknowledge God. Even when we age, even when we get older, we say, Lord, even if you've been very highly successful, we have to stop and step back and say, Lord, it's only because of you. So this entire story here of what's going, what's going on in the, the picture that's being, uh, being told is reminding us that we acknowledge God. Well, how do we do that today? We acknowledge God through Jesus Christ. We, we turn to Christ. He saves us. He makes us whole, the Bible says. We don't have to go through seven years of rebellion. Some of you have gone through seasons of rebellion from the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar had went seven years of rebellion. He paid the price. The prodigal son, he paid the price. The whole Bible is filled with stories of people who rebelled against God, who wouldn't repent and turn to the Lord, and they had to, they had to go down with the animals, and literally at that point, then God lifts them up because they finally repent and acknowledge the Lord. But for you and I, we don't have to do that. We follow Jesus. We recognize that everything comes from Him and He holds us, he holds us tight and we have a commitment to Him that is rock solid. Beecher, I want to invite you in the band to come forward. We're going to respond to the Lord this morning. If you have never gotten saved, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, if you want to join our church, if you want to become part of our church family, you can do that now. This is our time that we respond to God. So I want to invite everyone to stand up. Myself and Zach, we wait down front. And if you want to make a decision, if you want to, if you want to follow the Lord and become a believer, <clears throat> we talked about the ordinance of baptism, just like we had the ordinance of Lord's Supper. We've got baptism coming up soon. If you want to participate in that, you walk this aisle and say, Pastor, I want to be a part of Broadway. Or Here's my decision. So Zach, you come stand up here with me. The band's going to play. You respond. You make your decision public following Jesus. Now they fall 
but you have never failed me yet. It's waiting for change to come. Knowing the battle's won, and for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands, and great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness, I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. Exactly. The uh, deacons have uh, those. Uh, the Nevlin's fun. It's at the back of all the doors. worshiping uh, with us this morning. Uh, before we dismiss, uh, just a quick announcement as well. Uh, on the days we do the Lord's uh, Lord's Supper, we have a benevolent, a benevolent offering. So deacons will be standing at the exit. Uh, this goes to uh, serve people in our community, meet needs directly. It goes directly to those kinds of things. So uh, deacons will be at the exits for that uh, as we depart uh, this service. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, May we humble ourselves before you and see your greatness, Lord, that all things you rule and are, uh, you are the ultimate king. You are the sovereign of this universe, God. So may we submit ourselves to you, Lord, that uh, we are but dust and, uh, Lord, you are our creator. God, may we worship you for your greatness and for the things you do. And, uh, Lord, may we have our eyes focused on your kingdom to proclaim your greatness uh, to those around us and to live uh, lives holy and worthy of you, God. Convict us of our sin and um, Lord, may we do the things that will honor you in your name. God, we uh, lift up your name and you be with us as we leave this place today. It's in Christ's name. Amen. You are dismissed. I've seen you move You move the mountains and I believe I see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way. And I believe I see you doing.